Thomas Bayes was a British philosopher and priest who lived from 1701 to 1761. He attended the University of Edinburgh to study both theology and formal logic. After graduating, he returned home to assist at his father's chapel for a while, before moving out on his own. In a new town, he became the local minister, until he fell too ill to work and died at the age of 59. Bayes lived a relatively mundane life, and despite being a university-educated intellectual, he published only two works throughout his lifetime. The first is titled Divine Benevolence, and is a religious pamphlet responding to another one of the day, where he attempted to prove that the principal end of God's actions are for the good of humanity, however confusing they might be. The second of his works is titled An Introduction to the Doctrine of Fluxions. This one is very different, being a pamphlet on mathematics, and it's where Bayes defends Isaac Newton's calculus. However, this one was published anonymously. It's sometimes strange for us in the modern world to remember that science and religion were intertwined quite heavily back before the Industrial Revolution, and that the most educated people back then also tended to be quite religious. By all accounts, Bayes lived a relatively humble life and died in quiet obscurity. He left behind a number of unpublished works, written in journals or on random notes scattered around his study. Bayes' family asked his old school friend, Richard Price, to look over Bayes' private office before they cleaned it out. Price was a noteworthy public intellectual of his day, and while the family didn't really understand any of Bayes' unpublished writing, they figured that Price would be able to pick out anything of value, and they were right. A French mathematician, Abraham de Moivre, published a book titled The Doctrine of Chances. That phrase, the doctrine of chances, referred at the time to what we now call probability theory, the branch of math concerned with the probability that an event might occur. The book covered a wide range of topics, problems, and solutions relevant to the field. Price found within Bayes' study a discarded paper titled An Essay Towards Solving a Problem in the Doctrine of Chances. Bayes never published it during his lifetime because he considered it to be too unimportant, too obvious to be worth the trouble. But it turns out it was actually one of the most important essays in the history of modern mathematics, and it would become the foundation of our modern understanding of statistics and probability. So you bet that Price published that shit ASAP, though later reprints of the essay came with an alternate title more befitting its importance. A method of calculating the exact probability of all conclusions founded on induction. Bayesian probability comes from this paper. Most layman conceptions of probability are something like the frequency that some event will take place. You know, the percentage chance that a thing will happen. For Bayes, this was an incomplete way of viewing probability. Instead, he said that probability was a reasonable expectation based on current limited knowledge, which could be updated by adding additional knowledge to your understanding through empirical testing. This action of updating the probability is known as the Bayesian method, and Bayes' law reads something like, probabilities for a general population can be combined with testing to generate more accurate probabilities for a more specific population. Here is the formula that Bayes used to describe the relationship between general probabilities and specific probabilities. But honestly, this is one of those things where a real-world example will help you understand it way better than the math will. So I'm going to co-opt the example given on Arbital, since it is the most common one you'll come across online. Assume that you're a doctor, and you're screening a set of students for a disease called sickitis. You already know from past population studies that 20% of students catch sickitis at this time of year. You also have a test for sickitis, a tongue depressor, which turns black if it's pressed onto the tongue of a person who has sickitis. But the test isn't perfect, no test is. Among students who have sickitis, 90% of them will turn the depressor black. However, the depressor will also turn black for a healthy student 30% of the time. Now, let's say that a student comes into your office, you give him the test, and the tongue depressor turns black. What do you think the probability is that they have sickitis? Pause the video here and think of an answer. Most people's first knee-jerk answer is 90%, since the test is 90% accurate on sick students. But most people also pretty quickly revise that number down a bit, since 30% of healthy students also produce a black tongue depressor. It's somewhat common for people to do some quick and dirty napkin math on this, like 90% minus 30%, so maybe it's 60% of students that are actually sick after the test? Well, let's visualize the problem. Here's 100 students, 20 of whom are actually sick, and 80 of whom are actually healthy. As a doctor doing the tests, we don't know which of these students are actually healthy or sick, but as gods hovering over the hypothetical world we've created, we have access to perfect information. So we've defined the hypothetical as 20 are sick and 80 are healthy. So if the tongue depressor test turns black for 90% of sick students and 30% of healthy ones, simple math will show us that 18 of the 26 students will turn the depressor black, and 24 of the 80 healthy students will also turn the depressor black. The total number of students who turned the tongue depressor black is 42, and the total number of six students who turned the tongue depressor black is 18. So the odds that a student who turned the tongue depressor black is also actually sick is 18 out of 42, which is simplified to 3 out of 7, which is roughly 43%. If you want to visualize this too, imagine putting all the tongue-depressed students into a bag, and then reaching in and grabbing one. 
Looking at it visually, your intuition probably says that there's about a 40% chance that you'll pull out a sick student, doesn't it? Most people will find this answer counterintuitive. After all, the test correctly identifies sickitis 90% of the time, but that's only one of three ratios at play here. There's the probability that a test correctly identifies a sick student as sick versus incorrectly as healthy. There's the probability that a test incorrectly identifies a healthy student as sick versus correctly as healthy. And then there's the known ratio of sick students to healthy students, which is a data point we inherited from a previous study. 20 to 80. This doesn't mean that the tongue depressor test is useless, though. Now that we've tested a student, the probability that he has sickitis has changed, up to 43% from 20 for yes, and down from 80% to 57% for no. If you want to be even more certain, you can test the student a second time. Based on the test's false positive and false negative rates, the chance that a student is sick after two positive tests in a row is up from 43% to, I think, roughly 69%. You can repeat this process to get increasingly more accurate results. The point is that we begin with baseline information about the general population, which is the study that declared the infection rate to be 20%. In Bayesian probability, this is called the prior probability, or the prior. We then used a test with known quantities to gather information and update our knowledge, changing the likelihood that a specific student is sick from 20% to 43%. This new result is called the posterior probability. For the next round of testing, the posterior becomes the new prior. Bayes' method was intended to be used repeatedly to update probabilities over time with new evidence. There's a story about the development of this method that's been repeated several times. Sometimes it's Bayes in the story, other times it's Price. Sometimes it's balls, sometimes it's coins, but it doesn't really matter. The story goes that there's a perfectly flat surface, generally a large table, and Bayes has his back to it. He can't see what's going on. An assistant tosses a ball onto the surface, where it bounces a bit and then comes to rest. Based on the sound the ball makes, Bayes has a general idea of where the ball is. The assistant then tosses a second ball, which also makes more sound. And he then tells Bayes where the second ball is on the table relative to the first ball. Like, is it a bit more south, a bit more west, whatever. The assistant then tosses a third ball and tells Bayes where the third ball is in relation to the first two. And this continues on and on. All the while, Bayes is keeping extensive notes of the positions of the balls the assistant is throwing onto the table. Using this data, Bayes' assumption of where the first ball is becomes more and more refined. He can never truly know exactly where the first ball is on the table without turning around and looking for himself. But his guesses get closer and closer with each new ball thrown. This is how Bayesian probability works. Bayes didn't believe in this ultimate skeptic Cartesian view of the world, where reality didn't exist and it was simply a product of our minds. But he also didn't believe in the supreme rationality of the human mind either. Bayes believed that although we are ultimately subjective creatures, our rational faculties allow us to collect new information about the world, and we can use that information to update our beliefs to be more accurate, more in line with the objective reality outside of our perception. We can never be perfectly congruent with the objective reality, but we do have the tools to get closer and closer over time, to basically be congruent enough. This is why, for Bayesians, evidence doesn't change your mind, it updates your mind. It doesn't change your beliefs, it updates your beliefs. Because even if you go through a massive paradigm shift and come to believe in something completely different than what you did years ago, like an atheist becoming religious or vice versa, you are still ultimately building on your priors. Let's go back to the six students. Another useful way to visualize the problem is as a series of merging and diverging streams or waterfalls. Imagine two waterfalls, one with red water and one with blue water. Don't worry, it's not demonic or a chemical spill or something. Now, imagine that part of the way down the waterfall, some of the water merges into a third stream. So at the end, you have a red stream, a blue stream, and a purple stream. The starting amount of water is the same as our sick and healthy students, 20% red water and 80% blue water. The diverging streams are our true and false positives versus true and false negatives of the tongue depressor test. So 10% of the red water remains red, that's the false negatives. 70% of the blue water remains blue, that's the true negatives. The 90% true positives and the 30% false positives mix into the purple stream, the purple stream being the collection of all positives, whether true or false. The movement from the top of the waterfall to the bottom represents conducting the test and using the new knowledge to update our priors. Mathematically, Bayes' law reads, prior odds multiplied by likelihoods equals posterior odds, and the waterfall example makes it very easy to visualize that. At the top of the waterfall, the odds are 1 to 4 that a student is sick, 20% to 80%. At the moment of merger, the likelihood that a test is a true positive versus a false positive is 3 to 1, 90% true positives versus 30% false positives. The true positives are 90% of the 20, and the false positives are 30% of the 80. And at the bottom in the purple stream, the updated odds that a student is sick is now 3 to 4, or 3 over 7, or 43%. As a result of this new evidence, your own belief about the student you're examining should be a bit different at the bottom of the waterfall as compared to what it was when you were at the top, after the test versus before it. The chance of the student truly being sick rose from 20% to 43%, and that should change your belief on whether or not the student is actually sick, at least a little bit. 
This change in belief is called a Bayesian update, or a belief revision, or sometimes just updating your priors. We can keep going over the mathematics side of this conversation, but it's actually kind of boring. The last important math point of Bayesian probability is that you never actually hit 0 or 100, meaning you can never be absolutely certain something is true or false. But you can get close enough that you're comfortable assuming something is true or false, and then acting accordingly. Continued testing will move the number closer and closer to 100%, but it will never actually reach 100%. However, in the real world, most people will view 91 or 98 as close enough and begin treatment anyway. Bayesian probability is an incredibly powerful analytical tool. If you can think on Bayesian lines, you've already got a leg up on most people. It's a core part of the scientific method, it's the main way that machine learning does its updating, and it's got all sorts of more practical or mundane applications as well. For example, in 1968, the nuclear submarine USS Scorpion failed to arrive at port in Virginia. The US Navy commanders at the time were certain the submarine was lost somewhere off the East Coast, but an extensive search turned up nothing. John Craven, a scientist who knew of Bayes' method, adapted it to search patterns. He took some initial data, based on long-range underwater microphones, which led him to believe that the submarine was likely somewhere near the Azores, not the eastern coast of the US. Craven then divided the area up into a grid, and began to assign Bayesian probabilities to each one. He asked experienced submarine commanders to each draw up a hypothesis about how the submarine could have sunk, and then assigned a rough estimate of probability that each disaster could have happened in each section of the grid, based on various factors, like if the water was more or less turbulent, or shallow, or whatever. Craven then assigned another layer of probabilities to each square, this time being the chance that even if the wreck were there, he would be able to find it. For example, even if a square had a high probability that the submarine was there, if it had a low probability that he could find it because it was too deep for his equipment or something, he just wouldn't search there. Using Bayesian probabilities, Craven designed a search pattern taking into account both likely places the submarine would have sunk and places that he could search given his limitations, and he focused on the most likely spots it would be in first. And it took him a few months, but he eventually found the sub. Splish. Craven's method would eventually be published in the 1985 paper Optimal Sequential Search, a Bayesian approach, and it wouldn't be the last time it was used in this way. The optimal sequential search helped find the wreck of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 back in 2015, and Air France Flight 447 in 2009. And perhaps most sensationalistically, it was used to find the wreck of the SS Central America, a ship that sunk in 1857, carrying 30,000 pounds of gold. I feel so alive! In 1988, a treasure hunter named Tommy Thompson located the ship using the optimal sequential search method by gathering up all available data and assigning probabilities to each possible location. It's too bad he wasn't smart in other areas of life. He ended up trying to steal the gold for himself, and he was eventually caught while on the run in 2015. I can explain! I... What the? Tell it to the judge! The Bayesian method has also been used to weigh evidence in legal cases, to predict repeated games of chance with pretty good accuracy, to figure out if a partner is cheating on you by considering all the available evidence. Basically, any situation where you don't know the answer, but you have some accurate yet incomplete information, Bayes' law applies. Your general information about a phenomenon can be combined with testing to generate information specific to your situation, and it's that specific information that we really want. To loop back around to a medical example, we know that ibuprofen tends to help with headache pain. That's the general information. But despite this, we still wouldn't want to give ibuprofen to a person who's allergic to it, even if they have a headache. That's the specific information. And most people who are allergic to ibuprofen, they probably found out by taking a pill for their headache one day and having a really bad time. That's the test. Thinking in a Bayesian way is a foundational rational tool. It helps keep in check personal biases, ideological programming, all sorts of mental pitfalls you might stumble blindly into. The problem is, contrary to popular opinion, human beings are not actually all that rational. As humans, we like to think that we're rational, but actually, we're usually not. Usually, we're creatures of habit, running on autopilot. I've spoken about Jonathan Haidt and the Righteous Mind on this channel a whole bunch. You know what I'm talking about already. I'm going to lean on a different book this time, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Kahneman was an Israeli psychologist whose work primarily focused on the psychology of judgment. One of Kahneman's great early discoveries, back in the 1970s, was what he called prospect theory, which basically popped the bubble that was the Austrian School of Economics. I mentioned prospect theory in passing in a previous video. The basic idea is that humans tend to feel more bad about a failure than we feel good about a success, generally around 40% more. In practical terms, it goes something like this. If the average person gained $100 and felt a corresponding 100 units of happiness, however we're measuring that, that same person, if they lost $100, would feel around 140 units of sadness. Kahneman's research revealed that we take losses worse than how well we take equivalent gains, and that mental pitfall absolutely affects our economic decisions. 
decision making, despite being irrational. A commonly cited example of this effect working in action is of a Washington DC grocery store that wanted to promote reusable bags. So it offered 5 cents back to each customer for every reusable bag that they brought with them. This policy did almost nothing. However, when the store began to charge 5 cents for every plastic bag the customer used, this actually spurred people to bring more reusable bags from home. Even though the economic calculations were ultimately equal, gain 5 cents for every reusable bag, customers judged having to pay 5 cents as being more punishing than being given 5 cents was beneficial. A core part of Austrian economics is the concept of praxology. Mises actually believed that all of economics was actually just a subset of praxology. Praxology is the theory of human action. Ology meaning study, and praxis meaning action. The idea is that humans engage in purposeful behavior, in contrast to the reflexive behavior of animals. And there are some pretty good reasons to believe this, especially back in Mises' day. When Mises was writing, Enlightenment thought reigned supreme, the scientific method, rationality, empiricism. All across the political spectrum, the idea that reason guided all human action was in vogue. For the broader left wing, this meant command economy socialism, the belief that if we just had enough data on everyone and everything at all times and places, we could rationalistically plan out the whole of society a priori. For the broader right wing, this meant individualistic libertarianism, the belief that because human reason was king, all decentralized economic activity was purposeful. Individuals made meaningful choices in the market based on their own wants and needs. Both of these very different political beliefs rested atop the same foundation, that human behavior was, at its core, rational. Now, if you know me, you know I don't like socialism or libertarianism. That's something I've gone over in a previous video already. But for our purposes today, it's important to point out that they're both wrong here, and Kahneman helped show it. Human behavior is actually mostly irrational, and you probably know this intuitively. How many times have you done something stupid without thinking about it, and immediately said, why the hell did I do that? In fact, a perfect example comes from one of my TikTok Tuesdays recently, where these two knuckleheads wanted to light a firecracker with their lighter, drop the firecracker into the bottle, and run away. Well, why did the woman light the firecracker, drop the lighter into the bottle, and run away still holding the firecracker, leading to it exploding in her hand? Surely this wasn't an action she rationally chose. Surely she didn't mean to do it, but nonetheless, she did. It's pretty amazing that all it takes is a couple of retards fucking around with an explosive to blow praxology out of the water. Humans can be rational, but they're often not. And what this means for economics is that the Austrian idea that individuals make meaningful choices in the market in accordance with their wants and needs is sometimes true, but it's not regularly true. This is not to say that Austrian economics is wrong about everything, far from it. The Austrians came up with the subjective theory of value, marginalism, and the calculation and knowledge problems, all of which have become successful enough to be accepted as mainstream economic thought. But it's in praxology, the view that economic theory should be exclusively derived from the basic principles of humans acting in their own self-interest, that the Austrian school falls short, and it's due to humanity's innate irrationality. For Kahneman, this meant that individuals made poor economic choices, not simply due to subpar information, but also due to subpar reasoning. Kahneman was one of the founders of the behavioral school of economics. If the Austrian school described how humans behaved rationally in the market, and humans are almost never perfectly rational, the behavioral school described how humans behaved irrationally in the market, and what kind of cognitive biases and rationalizations and other psychological traps affected economic activity. Kahneman heavily relied on the Bayesian method in his work. Here's an example from Thinking Fast and Slow. An individual has been described by a neighbor as follows. Steve is very shy and withdrawn, invariably helpful, but with little interest in people or in the world of reality. A meek and tidy soul, he has a need for order and structure, and a passion for detail. Is Steve more likely to be a librarian or a farmer? That's not just a quote from the book, by the way. That's a question for you again. So pause the video and think of an answer. Most people immediately say that it's more likely Steve is a librarian, because Steve's personality type fits the stereotype of a librarian. Fair enough. But most people don't realize that there are actually 20 male farmers to every one male librarian in the United States. That number has actually gone up quite a bit since Common published the book, but uh, fuck it. There's a faulty assumption that most people jump to that the ratio of librarians to farmers is one to one, because both professions are only mentioned once in the question. But even just a little bit of rational thinking will quickly dispel that assumption. How many libraries are there in the states versus how many farms? How essential is a library's work compared to a farm's work? You probably felt the assumption dissolve in your head as I was describing the problem. At least you did if this was your first time hearing it. Actively engaging your brain for just a few seconds immediately wipes clean the intuitive feeling that there are just as many librarians as there are farmers. But the assumption felt very real right up until you thought it, didn't it? The criticism here isn't that people hold biased or bigoted views about the common personality types of librarians and farmers. I don't give a shit about that. The criticism is that people commonly fail to incorporate information about the ratio of farmers to librarians in their judgments. While it's true that the question didn't provide the information, this isn't an elementary school math class where you're expected to only consider the information the teacher gives you. 
Did you even think to ask the question on your own on your first go? Most people don't. Laying out the farmer librarian problem visually, you should notice that it works like our sixth student problem from before. Based on the ratio of farmers to librarians, let's put 10 librarians and 200 farmers on the screen. If we assume that 90% of librarians have the same personality traits as Steve versus 30% of farmers, just like the tongue depressor test, that still leaves us with 9 librarians and 60 farmers. So even if your initial bias tells you that Steve is more likely to be a librarian because it feels like he would be, Bayesian statistics shows us that even if librarians are more likely to be like Steve than farmers are, Steve himself is more likely to be a farmer than a librarian. If you want a more extreme example of human bias as it relates to Bayesian thinking, consider the Linda example from the book. Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and she also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. You can tell that this problem was written in the 70s, maybe the early 80s, but I think it still maps onto the modern era pretty well. Given this information about Linda, is it more likely that she's a bank teller or a bank teller who's active in the feminist movement? Once again, pause the video and think about it. Most people intuitively choose the second answer, bank teller who is active in the feminist movement. 89% of people choose this, in fact, even though it has to be wrong. Think about it. The set of all people who are bank tellers and active feminists is necessarily smaller than the set of all people who are bank tellers, because the set of all people who are bank tellers contains both the set of all people who are bank tellers and active feminists, and the set of all people who are bank tellers and not active feminists. If the subset contains all possible Lindas, then so does the set. It is a mathematical impossibility that Linda is more likely to be a bank teller who is an active feminist than just a bank teller. But humans aren't really rational creatures. And when logic comes head to head with representativeness, representativeness tends to win out, at least if we're thinking on autopilot. The naturalist Stephen Jay Gold described his own struggle with the Linda question. He knew the correct answer, of course. And yet, he wrote, A little homunculus in my head continues to jump up and down, shouting at me. But she can't just be a bank teller. Read the description. The logical fallacy still feels right intuitively, even if mathematically we know it's impossible, because the description of Linda is representative of a feminist activist, despite how the probabilities actually work out. For Kahneman, representativeness is defined as any mental shortcut that we use to decide whether or not a specific object has sufficient qualities to belong to a class of objects. You know, we might assume that a person wearing a police officer's uniform is a cop, even though he might not be. Maybe he's an actor coming off set, or maybe he's a scammer, that sort of thing. This is an example of a representativeness heuristic, a biased but necessary part of brain functioning that can't just be socialized or educated away. In order to reduce the stress on our brains and increase the speed of mental functioning, we recognize patterns through repeated exposure and mentally build representatives of those patterns in our memories. We don't do this purposefully, it's mostly out of our control. We identify a person who looks like a cop as a cop because he fits the stereotype of a cop, even if he's not actually a cop. And rationally, we all understand that anyone can put on a police uniform. He still feels like one to us. He aligns with the representation of the idea of cop in our minds. So he is one. And because this heuristic is generally correct, we usually don't think to interrogate it. I recently went over Professor Hannah Pitkin's book, The Concept of Representation. And if you've watched that video, you probably already know where I'm going with this. The desire for political or cultural representation, as laid out by Pitkin, is part of the same brain circuitry as Kahneman's representative heuristics. When people want to be represented, whether that's having their interests fought for in a legislature, or to see themselves or their group in a piece of media, part of that desire is wanting their positive biases to align with the real world as they see it. And all sorts of problems start to crop up when those two things don't actually align. See that video for further details. Kahneman's research shows us that pattern recognition is the beginning of knowledge, not the end of it. And people who simply see the patterns like a schizo and then fail to think anything else through beyond that first step routinely fall into mental traps. But okay, you now know how this all works. Let's start applying it to some actual scenarios. Perhaps the most important thing I've said in this whole video is that you shouldn't think of your beliefs as changing, but updating. I said in a random video like a year ago or something that a real belief doesn't feel like a belief to the believer. It feels like reality. It feels like the way the world is. To a Muslim who is a true believer, when Muhammad jumped on a winged horse and flew away, that wasn't a metaphorical story. That actually happened. As in, if you were to get into a time machine and go back to that moment, you would see, in reality, Muhammad actually get onto a winged horse in the flesh and fly away. Now to me, as an atheist, that's an absurd belief. But to someone who truly believes it, that's reality. That's what happened. It's not just metaphor. Here's a more mundane example of what I mean. Assume that you're a detective investigating a murder. There's a dead body in the alleyway, and you find my hair and fingerprints not on the body, but in the area, maybe on a dumpster beside the body. There's no other evidence at the scene. It's reasonable for you as a detective to list me as a possible suspect and begin investigating me. From your point of view, the world looks like one in which I might have killed the guy, and you're justified in hauling me in and interrogating me and looking through my stuff. 
However, let's also assume that objectively I actually didn't do it. I just happened to walk through the alley five minutes earlier, and any evidence I left behind is incidental. From my point of view, the world looks like one which I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And in fact, the police are treating me quite unfairly. I know I didn't do anything, so why are you interrogating me? One big reason for the restrictions on police power is that it's easy to look back with hindsight and say where you should have investigated. But in the moment, you don't know what you don't know. In this example, both you as the detective and I as the suspect have different beliefs about the way the world is. I believe I'm innocent. You aren't so sure. You might even believe that I'm guilty and I'm going to get away with it if you do nothing. These beliefs feel like reality to the believer, and the individuals who believe them will behave accordingly, as they feel like they're acting appropriately with the way that reality feels to them. The question you have to ask is, are they? And the answer to that is found in Bayes' law. In the hypothetical, the evidence against me is weak Bayesian evidence. The hair and the fingerprints are on the dumpster, not the body. Based on that alone, it's not unreasonable to want to look into me. The probability that I'm involved has gone up a little bit. But it is unreasonable to assume that I'm guilty with only that evidence. The updated prior does not close the gap nearly that much. Though this application of Bayes' law doesn't use hard and fast numbers the way the six students example did, you can still roughly ballpark how it works. It's a very intuitive process. My fingerprints and hair on the dumpster is weak evidence. If my fingerprints and hair were on the body, it would be strong evidence. Finding the murder weapon in my house would also be strong evidence. Finding it in somebody else's house would actually be strong evidence in the other direction. Remember, this process still never reaches 100% accuracy. There's always a small chance that somebody came along and planted that weapon there. And if you discovered evidence that was planted, then that too would update your priors in a new direction. But once you've laid out all the evidence you've collected, it's more likely that most of the anomalous bits point to random chance than they do to conspiracy. If you, as the detective, discover the murder weapon in somebody else's house, and you also happen to get the testimony of a reliable witness that saw the victim with the other guy at the time of the murder, it would be pretty silly to think that my hair and fingerprints on the dumpster still make it more likely that I'm the murderer, and it's actually all a big cover-up or something. That is still slightly possible, but the more reasonable excuse is that I just happened to walk by five minutes before, and the incidental evidence is just that, incidental. Conspiratorial thinking is generally the hallmark of an irrational person, but not because conspiracy theories are always wrong. In fact, there are many high-profile conspiracy theories that turned out to be true, and this shouldn't surprise you, because there's nothing inherently implausible about multiple people coming together and conspiring to do something. No, the problem with conspiratorial thinking is even as new evidence comes out that, for a Bayesian thinker, would update his priors away from the conspiracy hypothesis, the conspiracy theorist continues to cling to those few scraps of incidental evidence that still point in his preferred direction while disregarding all other pieces of evidence, no matter how overwhelming. Here's a few quick real-world examples. Consider the Alec Baldwin trial. The initial story seemed to point to Baldwin accidentally firing the gun and killing Hutchins. But as more evidence came out, the updated priors went off in a wild direction. First, we learned that it was not considered the actor's responsibility to secure a gun, but the armorer's responsibility as a professional who knows more about guns than actors do. Second, we learned that the gun had been used for target practice earlier that day. Third, we learned that the ammo supplier probably mistakenly shipped live rounds to the set. Fourth, we learned that the armorer herself was unprofessional. She had a history of sloppy work and didn't properly check the gun. With each new data point that appeared, the Bayesian probability rapidly moved away from Baldwin himself simply being a murderer. Or how about when Stellar Blade was the big gaming news item of the day a few months back, and gamers were screaming online that Sony was actively censoring the sexual content out of the game with the day one patch? That's an okay initial prior. It certainly happened before. But some of these people were demanding that you strictly adhere to that prior, no matter what new evidence comes out. Even as public statements from the developer contradicted that view, or even as new outfits that were even more lewd started coming out, which wouldn't have happened if the initial prior was perfectly accurate. My explanation of South Korean copyright law better fit all available evidence, and yet it was rejected by a small, die-hard contingent of culture warriors who behaved as if moving off of the initial prior made you an SJW cuck and a traitor. And now that Stellar Blade has moved out of the news cycle, nobody has noticed that in the most recent patch, Shift Up has added upskirt wind physics and improved boob squishiness. Yet again, another piece of evidence pointing away from the idea that censoring sexuality was the cause for the day one patch. Total dev vindication. Okay, how about an example where, in the end, the online right wing was actually correct about one of these smaller news stories? Well, consider the Paris Olympic ceremony outrage. Online Christians were up in arms that the Last Supper was being mocked. So let's examine that situation with the Bayesian method. At first glance, it looks like the Last Supper. The framing of the shot, the location of the people, the fat woman who has the halo thing. That's all strong evidence in favor of it being the Last Supper. There's your initial prior. However, there's also strong evidence in favor of it not being the Last Supper. 
The blue guy with grapes in his hair on a platter is a Greek god whose name I butchered last time, so I'm not even going to try. And he's associated with a different large feast. This character is not a part of the Last Supper imagery, and yet here he is. At this point in the Bayesian method, it's reasonable to believe that the first piece of evidence is incidental, since history is filled with many different feasts. However, further evidence continued to come out. The fat woman later posted on her Instagram that it was, in fact, the Last Supper, a post that she deleted. She later posted that it was the Greek feast instead. Both posts could be legitimate. Maybe she got it wrong and she corrected herself. Maybe she saw the shit show coming and covered her ass, or she was told to do so by higher ups. Then, the director came out and said that it was not the Last Supper, but also the producer came out and said that it was. And then somebody discovered the French translation of the name of the performance directly referenced the Last Supper, which made it obvious at that point. Now, I'm not a Christian, so I don't care too much personally, but if you found fat lesbian Jesus offensive, that is your right to be triggered. However, the point is, the Bayesian method means updating your priors as new evidence comes out. It does not mean ideologically and irrationally devoting yourself to your initial opinion, even if it turns out in hindsight that initial opinion ends up being accurate. Adhering to the Bayesian method means following the evidence, even if you don't like where it leads. Even if it eventually leads you back to where you started, that doesn't matter. To a non-Bayesian, Bayesian thinking looks from the outside like a person is a flip-flopper, or a fence-sitter, or is unprincipled. But frankly, those terms are just negative reframings of positive attributes. A flip-flopper is a person who changes his position to an opposing one. But if new evidence leads in that direction, that is exactly what you should do. A fence-sitter is somebody who maintains neutrality or non-commitment on an issue. But in the absence of evidence, that's also exactly what you should do. Having principles is often a good thing. But devotion to a principle in the face of contradicting evidence, where the truth may lie somewhere else, that is simply being ideologically captured. After all, an ideology can be described as a set of principles. I'm not blind, by the way. I know there's this persistent criticism floating around right now that I've changed. Most people who say this are former viewers or hate watchers, occasionally a fellow YouTuber who wants to take me down. They all say roughly the same things, that they thought I was based and red-pilled when I was criticizing socialists and progressives. And to be clear, I still have no real love for those groups. My critiques of them still mostly hold true. But now that I'm criticizing Trump supporters or reactionaries or monarchists or libertarians, I've betrayed my former positions. But this is just incorrect. I've said many times over the years, I'm a liberal. That wasn't a dog whistle. I meant it when I said it. I've also said many times over the years, I'm not a Trump supporter. In fact, I repeatedly said during his term that I was pretty neutral on him. I said it in 2020 in a video where I laid out my criticisms of his first term. I said it in 2017. One day, Trump's going to have an actual scandal come up. Not rape allegations that materialized at a thin air. Not locker room talk about grabbing him by the pussy. Not hiring hookers to piss on Obama's bed in Moscow. But an actual, legitimate scandal. Something that should completely disqualify him from sitting in the president's chair. And you know what? No one's gonna give a shit. Nobody's gonna believe the media anymore when they run with the most desperate, most pathetic fake news pieces to somehow hinder the Donald. Everybody's gonna be desensitized to hearing Trump doing something ridiculous all day every day. And whatever the scandal will be, Trump will get away with it. Scott fucking free because the news media has spent the last few years crying wolf so much that nobody's gonna believe them. And boy was I right about that. And now in 2024, I'm no longer neutral on Trump, I'm anti-Trump. And, per Bayesian thinking, my beliefs about Trump have been repeatedly updated as I've become more knowledgeable about him. That process of moving from neutral on Trump to explicitly anti-Trump, and what evidence caused me to update my priors, that will be the subject of the next video. So stay tuned for that. But I haven't betrayed anything. I was never, in principle, pro-Trump. I have a set of core morals, probably in part grounded in some innate psychology of mine, and those morals filter down into my philosophical outlook on life, and that outlook tilts based on real-world evidence. Learning and discovering new things means updating my priors, which means that I come to believe different ideas will be more or less effective at seeing my preferred morals implemented in the world. But the morals themselves have remained the same for a very long time now. I went on all of those reading arcs from 2021 onward, not to indoctrinate myself into some new belief system, but to update my priors. The ANCAP reading arc, the fascist reading arc, the neo-reactionary reading arc. I didn't really need a socialist reading arc. I did that back in university, but I still brushed up over there too. And the more that I read stuff that I disagreed with, the more certain I became that my current views, which are kind of liberal and kind of conservative, were more or less correct. Most people don't do this. They don't go out looking to update their beliefs. They go out there looking to confirm their beliefs. Most people think in terms of what the British professor Mark Bever coined as webs of belief in his book, The Logic and History of Ideas or what Ilka Karya, I can't fucking pronounce that, from the University of Helsinki called ideational constellations, or what Alex Vizina of York University here in Canada called belief constellations. I don't know if the three of them just came up with the same idea, or if they're all replying to a previous guy who I don't know about. It doesn't really matter though. Here's a great example of a web or a constellation of belief from the right-wing Twitter aggregator and wokeness. The experts told us Joe was fine. The experts told us take the vax. The experts told us the laptop was fake. The experts told us border is secure. The experts told us inflation is transitory. The experts told us 2020 was the most legitimate and secure election in history. 
Remember who the propagandists are. Never trust any of them again. It's reasonable to assume that whoever End Wokeness is, I think some people are currently speculating right now that it's Jack Posobiec, and that wouldn't surprise me one bit, but whoever they are, they probably hold the following set of beliefs based on this tweet. That Joe Biden is in a state of cognitive decline. That the coronavirus vaccine is dangerous. That Hunter Biden's laptop is real and contains proof of corruption. That the US-Mexico border is wide open and illegals are pouring through. That inflation continues uncontrolled. That the 2020 election was stolen and Trump is the true legitimate president. Forget about whether or not these are true claims. I want you to notice that they have pretty much nothing in common with each other. One of these statements could be true, and it would have almost no bearing on whether or not any of the other statements are also true. The only thing they have in common is that they all come from, quote, the experts. And the repetition of that term in the tweet is meant to hammer home in your head that each claim comes from a singular source, and that if one claim is false, then they must all be false, because the source itself is false. Except the experts is not a singular source. That's an oversimplification primarily for propaganda purposes, reducing it down to the expertise class or the managerial class who use the government as their proxy. In reality, different people from different fields had different views at different times on all of these topics. There is no Bayesian understanding here. There's no updating of beliefs happening as new evidence comes to light. There's just a web of topics related to each other only through a shared mutual outrage at their perceived source as part of the culture war. And the leftoids aren't innocent of this either. They do it too. If I were to conjure up some leftist end wokeness account, they would probably put out a similar tweet with a similar set of webbed beliefs. That emotional safety takes priority over free speech and expressing bad opinions should be punished. That capitalism, colonialism, and systemic racism are the root cause of all problems we face. They are relevant to every possible discussion, and focusing on other things is bigotry. That any action used by an oppressed person against their oppressor is justified. That biological sex does not exist, and gender is fully fluid and can be changed at will. And that if the world does not convert to solar, wind, and hydropower, but not nuclear, we will make the planet uninhabitable within our lifetimes. A sub-belief here is that having children is immoral, due to the bleak future they face. Regardless of whether or not these claims are true, they also exist in an irrational constellation of belief. In both cases, the ideas are dumbed down to make them appear to come from a single source, using a single method for a single purpose. And that's convincing to people because it's a comforting story. When I say comforting, I don't necessarily mean it makes them feel good. What I mean is it's easy to think through. Running through Bayesian updates on each of your beliefs is not only mentally taxing, it's emotionally taxing, especially if you have to swallow some hard truths. It's much easier for a person to mindlessly accept a just-so story that explains everything in a simple manner and pins one person, or maybe a class of people, as the villains of history. Toppling that villain's a tough job, but thinking about toppling him as the solution to the problem is actually a lot easier than rethinking all of your beliefs in the face of new evidence. It's no surprise to me that people flock to simple stories to explain their problems, but those stories are almost never actually true. Recently, when I'm debating someone, I've taken to asking the other person, what evidence would you need to see in order to change your mind? Some people, most notably V, have responded to this question with the declaration that no evidence could possibly ever change their mind. If we examine this statement from a Bayesian point of view, what's being said here is that the current probability of a thing being true is either 100 or 0. The person is either fully convinced it's true or they're fully convinced it's false. The formula describes how probabilities can be updated by adding new evidence to the system. But the formula breaks if the prior odds are set to either 0% or 100%. No matter what new evidence is added to the formula, with any probability or any weight, the math will always work out such that the posterior odds are equal to the prior odds. What this means is, if no evidence can ever get a person to change their mind, then this person is incapable of updating their beliefs, in a Bayesian sense. They are mentally unable to incorporate new data as it appears, and they are ideologically committed to their prior odds to the point of being irrational. I know all humans are irrational, including you and I, but the Bayesian method allows us to overcome our irrationality and examine evidence truthfully. However, if the person's priors are at 0% or 100%, then Bayes' law breaks, because the person's comfortable irrationality takes precedent over the pursuit of the truth. One of the arguments I've had along these lines was over how much should you trust a government source. That's actually a good question to ask. There are solid reasons to distrust government sources, but the person who says, I will never trust the government, no matter what, they're all corrupt, they're all faulty, without exception, this is a person whose prior is set to zero, who is fundamentally irrational on this question. It's obvious that there are better and worse governments, both existing right now and also in the past, and probably the future too. If all governments are the same, and they're all purely corrupt, then all governments would be sitting equally at a Bayesian zero. It's almost self-evident that some governments are better than others, which means that at least some governments are not at a Bayesian zero, which then means that you should be able to update your beliefs about them given new evidence, at least if you're an intellectually honest person. The more reasonable debate along these lines is what should the Bayesian prior be? For example, if it's back in 2021 and the government comes out and says, the COVID vaccine is safe, what should the Bayesian prior be on this statement? Well, the government has lied to us before. It's also lied to us specifically about medical procedures before. 
the government is incentivized to get as many shots into arms as possible no matter what. And additionally, a new vaccine made with new technology that has limited testing is kind of spooky. That is all Bayesian evidence against the vaccine being safe, even if it's not the strongest evidence, which is why I personally think it was reasonable for laymen to be skeptical about the vaccine when it first came out. But it's not 2021, now it's 2024. How should any emerging new evidence over the past three years have updated your beliefs? Well, you've got stories that occasionally go viral about vaxxed athletes getting heart attacks, and that would probably give any normal person pause. But at the same time, how many doses have been given out at this point? Like 14 billion? If the vaccine was unsafe enough that 1% of people who took it died, that would be 140 million extra dead people right now who died of mysterious causes. No government would be able to cover that up. So when the government says in 2021 the statement, the COVID vaccine is safe, an anti-government person would probably set the prior of that statement being true as quite low. But after three years and this much new evidence, even he has to admit if he's being rational. The probability that it's a true statement, despite it coming from what is, in his view, an untrustworthy source, the government, has to be pretty high at this point. This is why Bayesian zeros and Bayesian 100s can actually be pretty toxic to rational public discourse. A person who still clings desperately to the idea that COVID vaccines are unsafe, ignoring all evidence to the contrary because they're motivated by this hatred of government, those guys will cling on to anything, no matter how irrational, as long as it justifies their preconceived notions, their prior beliefs. This criticism applies to anyone who is ideological and irrational, from religious fundamentalists to socialists who claim that it wasn't real socialism. Let's go back to that end wokeness tweet again. Let's say that you're not a Bayesian thinker, but still you only believe in a few of these positions. Well, since you don't have the full constellation lit up, what's probably going to happen is, whatever social group you find yourself in, that group is going to agree with you on some of these points either way. And over time, they're either going to change your mind so that you come to agree with the remaining ones. Maybe you're genuinely convinced, or maybe you just cave to social pressure because you want to keep your friends, doesn't really matter which. Or alternatively, that social group is going to expel you for not having pure beliefs. This actually explains why the online right wing has been more successful at growing its ranks and convincing new people to believe in their ideology than the online left wing, at least until very recently. The online left wing has spent the past 10 years purity testing their allies out of their camp, while the online right wing will see a person with a couple of stars in the constellation lit up and say, you know what, I can work with that. There's an expectation that the person will convert all of their beliefs eventually, but the right wingers tended to be patient, at least until recently. I think in the past couple of months we've seen the beginnings of the right wing's own purity spiral, which will serve to isolate people rather than convert them, just like the lefts did. There is a third, much rarer option, that your friend group is actually tolerant. I'm not paying lip service to the DEI idea of tolerance here. I mean truly tolerant. They will allow people into the group who have a wide variety of different beliefs. These groups are going to be where the majority of the Bayesians are, rather than the constellation thinkers. I've laid all of this out in the hope that at least some of you will begin to understand how I think. I haven't really changed that much over the years, but I have updated my knowledge. I've learned new things that better serve my morals than what I knew before. That doesn't mean ideological devotion. If in the future I learn something else that's even better, and it supplants what I know now, then fine, great. I'm not loyal to an ideology, and I'm certainly not loyal to a side or a political movement. I'm not perfect either. I regularly fall into traps of irrationality, for as hard as I try not to. But I have noticed that those people who really hate me, who have been obsessing about me for months or sometimes years now, they don't even try to pull themselves out of the trap. They view me as a traitor because I decided to not stay in the trap of irrationality. I learned, improved, and moved on, rather than ignoring the questions that were gnawing away at their ideas. Questions that they seemed almost oblivious to. It's tough to go against your own social group. I've done it several times, it's not fun. Going against sections of your own audience that are ideologically captured and demanding that you radicalize, that's never fun either. But Bayesian thinking has helped me through it all. It's helped me properly weigh and consider new ideas, even if they're unorthodox or unpopular or taboo. It's helped me identify ideologues, people who are captured, entirely incapable of actually considering a new idea, even though I'm still slow on the uptake of actually noticing them in my midst. And it's also helped me answer the age-old question, am I wrong or is everyone else wrong? That can actually be a tough nut to crack, memes aside. But if Bayes' law brings you to what looks like the truth, and meanwhile there's a mob of people who are all constellation thinkers telling you that you're wrong, the chances are what you're feeling bearing down on you is not the weight of the truth that you've missed, but the social pressure of wanting to discard the truth and conform. Don't do it. And there we have it. I hope you enjoyed the video, guys. If you can't tell by my voice, I'm currently pretty sick. I didn't record most of this video while sick, but I sure did edit most of it while sick, so I appreciate you sticking around till the end. There's a handful of other longer, more in-depth videos coming down the pipe as well. A bunch of these have to come out before the American election, so I guess I'll be working overtime the next few weeks, sick or not. I hope you check them out, even if we disagree. But yeah, thanks for all the support, and I'll see you guys next time. Have a good one. I love you.